Welcome to the Glass Lab Podcast, where we talk all things product development. It's our goal every month to introduce you to the people, ideas, and development tools that are shaping the hardware products we all use every day. Welcome to the Glass Lab Podcast. I'm Grant Chapman, CEO here at Glassboard. With me, I've got Ben Edinger, our Director of Product. And today we've got Christy Johnson, partner at Product. So Christy, welcome to the Glass Labs podcast. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah. So I think first of all, uh, love to have you introduce yourself briefly and what Product does and what you do there. Sure. Um, I am a mechanical engineer by degree. um, And at Product, I don't do engineering. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We help, we're an advisory firm. We help small medical device startups, biotech startups, startups. Established quality management systems and uh, product development processes. My jam is risk management, so I like to help teams put in place risk management files, um, do the risk analysis. Um, we do a lot of training. Um, we take a very um, hearts forward approach, we like to say, where we don't just like come down like um, your typical asshole consultant who will bring in yeah, the big guns and be like, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah, like, a, like we're not going to come in and tell you you're doing it wrong, stack like a folder of SOPs on your desk and then leave. If um, <laughs> yeah, that's one thing I poked around product's website and there is definitely the sentiment of like, we're not your typical advisory firm. Yeah. Is that more what you mean by that is uh, just kind of the quintessential consultant approach of like, we can templatize things, jump in, jump out. Mm-hmm. That's not the approach. Yeah. At product. What we want to do is really teach the people we work with the skills they need to apply the concepts and build the infrastructure that's going to help them um, not just in the job they're in or in the company mm-hmm. they're in, but then they can take that. And we want our teams to call us in three years and say, like, you taught me this. Here's what I just learned, this new trick. Let me teach you. Like, that's yeah. what that's yeah. like the spirit of it. Like yeah. enabling that self-serve mentality exactly. and then sharing that back. Right. And no, that's awesome. And when you say small to medium, what is small and what is medium size mm-hmm. for you guys? Like, where do you guys tap out typically? What's the upper size? Um, upper size... Um, this could we, be like people or revenue. I have no idea how to yeah, gauge this. Yeah, I mean, we serve we serve seed funded companies all the way up through like Series B usually. Okay. Um, so it could be our biggest team is in a pivotal clinical right now with um, they probably have, I don't know, 40, 50 employees. Okay. Um, but that's atypical. Most of our teams are like two PhDs from MIT with a cool idea. Mm-hmm. Our smallest company is a one man show who... This is a guy. He does everything. Yeah, the solopreneur, right? The like, solopreneur. We, we get a ton of those at Glassboard, and they're mm-hmm. they're always the most interesting and fun to work with. Mm-hmm. And then there's the challenge because you're like, you need more man hours. Yeah. How do we help you do some of these things without not letting you learn what you're doing? Right. You right? can't do everything. Yeah. Right. So that's that's fun. So you're you're also helping these guys effectively teach these skills, these processes, and find the right people. Maybe that you're not the one finding them, but when they hire them, you're helping train them yeah. up on how to how to do the thing. Yeah. We we help people find the right. We help teams find the right people too. We'll okay. we'll write job descriptions and set up infrastructure, and then bring in the right people to train uh, and train them on what we've just put in place for them. Yeah, I think it would be cool to go back into. You started out in product development. How did you not to box you in? No, but how did you get into the world of quality coming from product development? Um, I got into quality by working for a startup, a small startup, and having to bootstrap and learn all the things that needed to happen to get the product from a concept all the way through to the actual user, um, which is like a really painful process in your first experience. You know, I was hired as a mechanical design engineer doing disposable, single-use disposable development. Remember those days. <laughs> well, remember. Not to bury the lead, you two met there. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, she has a hard time calling me Ben without throwing turn on the end because uh-huh. my name for the longest time was Ben Turn because yeah. I was initially her intern. I did. I told my husband Jake this morning, I said, I'm going to go see Ben Turn. We're doing a podcast <laughs> together. He's like, how's Ben Turn? Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I know. Um, but being part of a small team, you just do what you have to do to get the product out. So that was not just mechanical design work, um, which I ended up making Ben do because he was better at it than I was, <laughs> even as an intern. <laughs> I'm like, look, you design it. I will get it packed, the packaging designed and developed, the whole thing verified and validated and launched, QC checked, um, and 
that was really the gist of like how, where I started tiptoeing into quality was all the all the other stuff that had to happen yeah. um, to make sure it got done right. Yeah. I wondered how much do you think that informs now? I know you guys lean into this whole training piece and I think jumping into it, especially when you're bootstrapping, it can feel so daunting and like such a nebulous task. Mm-hmm. Um, but having bootstrapped it yourself, I feel like you can probably look at people and go, no, you can do this. You can wrap your arms around it and piecemeal it and figure this thing out. Yeah. Yeah. You can figure it out and, and you can put in place a super lightweight process for yourself to fall for your team to follow that isn't super bulky and, and burdensome. And yeah. it doesn't, you know, I started my career at GE their design and development procedures are like on a different planet than <laughs> textbook thick, like, yeah, like it takes, you know, it takes a giant team because there's a million moving parts literally. And mm-hmm. like every person owns like, you know, a little tiny, like I owned one little tiny, not tiny. It was actually a really big bearing in a sump of one engine, but, <laughs> yeah. um, but that was like, you know, put your Clydesdale blinders on. This is where you live. Yeah. yeah and there's inputs and there's outputs and you need to make sure those both work and whatever you do in the middle works. Right. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting topic, too, because obviously we work with consultants like yourself to, to basically bring in this QMS piece and build that up. And I feel like there's two ends of the spectrum that we've met where on one side, it's like the text is the text. It's black and white. There's no interpretation. Thou shalt follow it to the T. And that it's going to be wonderfully compliant, but it's going to be totally burdensome, burdensome right? Mm-hmm. And then the other end is like every meeting is a four hour meeting of the minds where it's like, let's just hash it out. Let's debate. Let's figure this thing out. And that's wonderful and actually very fun, but not efficient Mm -hmm. either. And somewhere in the middle, I think lies probably a more strategic path. How do you think about that piece of it? You got to ask yourself the question, what's the point of quality? What are you trying to do? Can we ask you that? Yeah, what, what is the point of quality? <laughs> and and for those listening at home, what is quality? Like, what does this yeah. mean in the product development process? They've probably, any yeah. listeners heard us wax on poetic about like design and, and human factors and needs and like, how does that turn into like how thick the wall should be or how fast the chip has to run? But what does quality mean at a higher level from like what we're talking about here? Point of quality is to create certainty in what you're designing, what your device does, the output of it. That's all it is. You're trying to increase the certainty that things go right. And it, it's not that the engineers can figure it out. It's, a, it's that if they do, it's going to do it this way, right? Like this is right. the, the how fast the device needs to move. This is how heavy it should be. Those kind of things, right? Yeah. I mean, so, so back up and think about what defines quality for medical devices. Right now, there's two separate things. There's more, but two, two separate things. The regulation, 21 CFR Part 820 and the standard, ISO 1345 2016. Soon those will be one. They're coming together. It'll be beautiful. <laughs> what, what a world. <laughs> what a, what a world. time to be alive. <laughs> what a world. They're, they're, they're almost the same thing now. There are yeah. some differences. They're almost the same already. But you think about the spirit of why those exist. It's not a bunch of lawmakers or regulators sitting around trying to slow down innovation. This is decades and decades of the FDA looking at companies who have succeeded and saying, what did those, what did that team do? And likely the other way around, looking at the dumpster fire, it's like, how do we prevent that one? Exactly. Right. I think there's almost more lessons learned from the failures than the successes. There for sure are. (laughs) There for sure are. But if you, I mean, if you step through, like think about ISO 1345 and the sections that are required per the standard for, for your quality system as a medical device manufacturer, they're not super prescriptive. They have they tell you what you have to do. They don't tell you how to do it or mm-hmm. when to do it. Right. Those are best practices. Maybe there's a little bit of when to do it, but those are best practices that you can choose to implement at different times in your organization. Quality is not, um, it's not something that like you come back later and do. If you're asking yourself, is now the right time? You're already too late. Yeah, yeah. it's a perpetual effort. Yeah. Are you making a proto? Are you are you sketching a prototype on a piece of paper? Your quality is late. Yeah. <laughs> I mean but, it. And this is this is a, an interesting part. I would love to dive into is like truly what does it mean to be late in quality? Then like at that stage, you need the whole green light guru filled out and all that figured out, or is this quality like oh we have a you know a word doc that is our goals for the product and that's your start of quality? Yeah. Okay. Right. And this is this is the really fun part that's nebulous that everyone does differently. When you're super early, too much quality, too much infrastructure, 
kills your innovation. It kills your budget, frankly. And your engineers go crazy. Yeah. So, so it actually, it starts with, um, like you think about a PhD scientist who has something cool in their research project at Purdue. It's a tech transfer moment, right? It's a tech transfer moment. And they're like, I think I have something we can make a product out of this. First, you have to have a little tiny bit of quality <laughs> in the research lab to be able to trust what that person has created. So you think about like, um, I do a lot of work, product does a lot of work with in vitro diagnostics. We helped the NIH's Radix program bring dozens of um, diagnostics in the pandemic uh, through to EUA. And part of that, many of our teams were just like, hey, we got a new idea we think could work for a, a diagnostic. And we're like, how old are those reagents? what kind of materials did you use? When was the last time you calibrated that equipment? And people, the, the blank stare, but it works. Yeah. But if you had five people go execute the same thing. Would it happen every time? What procedure did you use? I don't care if it's written in your lab notebook. Did you hand your lab notebook to the next person? There's right. super, super easy, lightweight stuff. And when it comes to an electronic QMS, super powerful tool. Mm -hmm. But there is such a thing as too early. Right. And I, I think there's this like famous quote, and I forget who it's from, but like the difference between screwing around in science is just writing it down. It's true. Right. Like as long as you're writing down what and why you're doing it at the highest level. It's true. And even if you're in the early stage of research and you're, you know, you're, you're blowing through a prototype every day because you're just throwing stuff against the wall. You don't need to have the exact instructions to replicate that last experiment perfectly done. Mm -hmm. It's just the moment you pick that experiment, you got to go write those down. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's, this is this like funny line of like, you got to write down all the things you didn't do right. Not to the level of like someone could follow the cookbook, but that you could then at least pick the ones you need to go write right. about to move the next stage out of full research into development. Right. Right. So, so there's little stuff you need, um, Equipment management, a little tiny bit of equipment management. I mean, make it make a project in Jira, a free project in Jira to manage right. your equipment. Make like, you know, an issue for each piece of equipment and just make fields and put your information in there. Right. Like I bought the 3D printer on this date and I never serviced it, which is writing it down. It's not like you have to calibrate it. You just right. have to know when the last thing was. Yeah. And material management. Those are big things. A little bit of protocol execution mm -hmm. management, writing. I mean, we use Jira and Confluence a lot at mm -hmm. the very early stage because it's free for up to 10 people. Yeah. Right. You can even like like make a template, click a button every time you execute a, a protocol. Yeah. yeah. Fill it out. What did I learn today? Hit save. Then it, you just have your record right there. Well, and I think we've all been through our fair share of failures in product development. <laughs> and I think folks that are, might be listening that aren't as familiar with like regulated environments might look at this and just say, oh, red tape, headache. But mm -hmm. I think we've all seen where mm -hmm. this is more of an enabler than a hurdle, right? Those things are going to come back and be helpful. They're, you're going to kick yourself if you don't do them. Yeah. You'll forget. Oh, yeah. yeah. You'll never remember. Humans are forgetful. Yeah. And you're not the only one that's going to work on this. And that's what most people yeah. forget, right? You might start out as a team of one or two or five. But by the time you launch, that's going to be 10 or 20 or 50. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you can't train every person by hand and watch them make the mistakes and correct them. You need it written down that they can just read it and follow it and process becomes a thing. Yeah. Or the quintessential, Jim quit, so we don't know what that yeah. was, right? And we're never going to know. And he's pissed. Yeah, yeah he's not talking <laughs> to us ever again. Yeah. Oh, those, those are terrible moments. And I think yeah. the, that tech transfer piece is super interesting to me because mm -hmm. we get a ton of that at Glassboard yeah. where, you know, the business side of people will like an idea that started up in a university somewhere and come to us like, hey, we're ready to take this production. Can you make our drawings for us? Mm -hmm. And I look at this prototype, maybe, you know, if I'd even call it a prototype, more like a research, like a, yes. like a proof of concept. Yeah. I'm like, we have three years ahead of us before we talk about manufacturing drawings. Yeah. And the business guys, you know, just sit there and melt. I'm like, no, but this like medical device actually does take real time if it's complicated. Again, three years is for like electromechanical, full brand new equipment. Yeah. But that's real. And also, how much did your, uh, you know, your PhDs write this down? Yeah. Can I have instructions? Like, oh, yeah, here's the Nature article. I'm like, that is, that is not how this works. Right. Like, one published article is not documentation. Okay, so you have tech that comes out of research. You have a little bit of warm fuzzies because you've taken care to make sure that the data can be trusted that was generated. You move into development. What now? Do you need a full QMS now? 
You need to figure out what the goal is. Right, of the next phase and of the end goal. They're very different, but you need to identify both. Well, you're talking about phases. I'm talking about the product. Oh, sure, got it. What is the product? So you have to start with user needs. This is, so I really want to get into this because yeah. one of the things I would love to talk about is, is if humans. If Christy Johnson decided to go develop a consumer product, had nothing to do with medical device. Yes. What of these pieces that you've learned would you just say are, these are best practices regardless. This is yes. what helps a good product get made. And yes. I, I think that's where you're going. And I just want to plant a flag because <laughs> this is the stuff I geek out on. And yeah. yeah. Take it away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you think about your user needs, literally ask yourself the question, who are my users and what are their expectations? And craft statements. Um, my business partner, founder of our company, Devin Campbell, he, he has taught me to, uh, to write user needs statements using the actual term, the user expects, the mm -hmm. patient expects, the patient's caregiver expects, the da 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 da. Yeah. And keep them as simple statements. And you're not going to have a ton of user needs. You're going to have, um, I don't know, a dozen, maybe two, three dozen. But you're going to have these high-level expectations. You might have a regulator. Your regulator might be part of the... The needs and expectations. Yeah. Like they expect this thing to pass this test. Yes. They expect it not to break if it's dropped from three feet, right? They, they these expect. like simple things. Right. So then you take each of those user needs and you... You have to give your engineers direction on what they have to do to meet the user need, but just enough direction. You don't tell them how to do it in a use, in, in a design input requirement, right? And that's that's where I think like people get a little bit dangerous with answering the how. Don't tell me what kind of a heating mechanism to put in a device. Just tell me what temperature it needs to get to. Yep. And let the engineers then develop the specifications to meet the user to meet the design input requirement. Yeah, and it's shocking how far down the road folks can get without understanding who is going to be using their product or how they're going to be using it and what they expect from it. We've all been part of programs where the product gets developed to find out there was a critical user need that was just never identified, and I think that's just a piece where you really shouldn't be going through the motions, right? You should be doing the real legwork. Mm -hmm. This is the, like, uh, I forget who it's attributed to, maybe Abe Lincoln or something like that, but, like, give me six hours to cut a tree down. I'm going to spend the first four sharpening the axe. Like, this is the sharpening the axe. I'm going to put all my effort up front on those user needs because that's what's going to define how this thing rolls out. Yeah, so um, I mentioned risk management is kind of my jam. It's a space that, like... I just like, it's like my happy place. Um, so I have a mentor in risk management. His name is Ed Bills. Um, Ed helped write the ISO standards, ISO 14971 and 24971 for risk management. So we talk every week. <laughs> He's amazing. <laughs> I heard him on a podcast and immediately emailed him and was like, I need, I need you in my life. This is amazing. <laughs> can, can we talk? Can I've we... never seen someone's eyes get so big saying risk management. This is going to get good. Well, no, I have. I've heard people, I've seen people get that big of risk management, which is when they realize they haven't done any of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For uh, the wrong reasons. It's, it's shock, uh, not joy. Those are joyful calls. I'm like, oh, nothing? You don't have any risk management file at all? <laughs> no, but Ed, um, Ed has, uh, when, when he advises teams, he tells them, you're going to spend 30% of your time and your budget on planning. Oh, this is such a good topic. It's, crazy. it's so hard to tell new people in product development that this is really important and it's yep. boring and mm. it's expensive yep. and you don't see any outputs from it forever. Yep. But if you don't do this, everything else is just going to be a dumpster fire. It will be a dumpster fire and there will be like <laughs> one little user expectation. I saw a product. Wait, I saw a product <laughs> go all the way through from concept all the way through to um, animal studies and to a clinical evaluation. And in the end stage, it didn't meet the user's expectation. Yeah. It was too large of a surgical tool. They're yeah. like, it takes extra stitches. I don't want to use that. The product failed. Yeah. Shut it down. Millions of dollars. Or they could have like figured that out with like a 3D printed concept, not even a functional prototype, taking it to anyone that would use it and ask how would you want to use this? Well, here's We're the talking to a few more people than just a, a couple you know, stakeholders and right, saying that's right. the gospel now. Let's run at it. Well, I also see teams lose sight of state. I'll call it state of the art. Right. As, mm. as ISO 14971 calls. Keep going. Yeah. State of the, <laughs> state of the art. Um, 
it takes you three years to bring a, a medical device from like, I don't know, two, five years, somewhere in that yeah, range. It, it's more than one and a half Things, and it is less than infinite. <laughs> Things change. Yeah. Other products come up around you that are better mm-hmm. or worse. Regulators have new experiences that change how they are thinking about it. There are different expectations. You know, your surgeon is fine with a certain size tool. And then a couple of years later, they get used to using the Da Vinci, which is super small. And now they're like, I don't want that thing. It's huge. And you're like, I just spent yeah. five years. <laughs> you got to keep up on the state of the art. So, yeah. I mean, you, you create your user needs and you distill those into design input requirements but it's an iterative process. It's all fluid. No plan survives first contact is kind of the words we use. And I think the question I'd ask, who on the team should be keeping that pulse in the industry? Um, and this is like not for us to hear. We all know who this is. But, you know, for the people building teams and trying to get that together, what is that role and who? how do they do that? Mm. Okay, so I product doesn't do regulatory. Right, right. Okay, so regulatory is... Um, I think about it like the people who are writing your submission to whatever regulatory authority you want authorization from to sell your product in that jurisdiction Mm -hmm. or that geography. Um, We work with a couple of different, three different uh, regulatory teams that we know and love for different reasons. They're all good at different things. A lot of them are like ex-FDA um, those are the gems. Those are the gems. Because they're like, I would rip this apart this way, so we're going to cover that base. Right. They're like, hey, we I've reviewed 200 digital health 510Ks, and in my experiences, this would get laughed out because of these reasons. Yeah. Um, so for me, that's a, that's a regulatory function. You can keep track. I mean, you can set up your Google alerts for any terms you want, and you can... You yourself, anyone, engineer, quality, um, a product manager can go into the FDA's 510K database, de novo database, watch the news, um, go, go in to conferences, go to conferences, yeah. um, also look at adverse event reporting from the FDA and see like what is happening with the particular like niche of a product that you're making. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you're like other stuff on the market and other stuff, you're making a CPAP machine. And the CPAP machines right now are like in a shitstorm because of all these problems, right? Mm-hmm. They're all being recalled for all these different reasons. Which is a beautiful thing about medical device, right? They make it so easy to just go research mod database. What are these complaints? Like, yeah. how do I dig up and not make the same mistakes other folks have made or to make a better product? Yeah. Uh, we started to get into it really quickly. For folks that haven't been through it, could you just lay out the relationships between the controls, you know, user needs, design inputs, outputs, V and V? And then maybe we can get into risk management and all that good stuff. Can you just, that workflow, I think you, you speak about it well. And for folks that haven't heard it, I think it's a, a good I, thing to hear. I can. Is it still a maybe we can get into risk management then? For oh, sure. 100%. Okay. Yes. Yeah. As long as there's a guarantee. For yeah. It. <laughs> um, okay. So you start with your user needs, which are your highest level user expectations. Um, you distill that down into design input requirements. Um, user needs require validation. How do you validate a user need? Um, It's usually like a clinical, you think about like, did we make the right device? How do you answer that question? Um, For all of your, all of your design inputs, you create a test for those. Um, So those are verification tests. It's the difference between verification and validation. You validate user needs, you verify design input requirements. Um, You really, uh, you think about a a design input requirement um, that has, asks you to um, make a certain temperature. Your design output is literally the thing that creates that temperature. It's the part of the design that helps you. Yeah, it's the the heater, the cooler, whatever part of the design. The chunk of code, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then your your design verification is how you test to make sure that you reach that Get thermocouples out, hit data record, go yeah. through your temperature sweep, and yep. upload that file. And back, we did this on the prototype, and then when you get into production, we did it on production units as well, right? Yep. By tracing that you're you're tackling those along the way. Mm-hmm. It's, it's so simple, but it's uh, amazing how often it can be overlooked. It's con- um, yeah, it's confusing. Yeah, but it, the one thing I I think is so good about all of these processes is in medical device, it's very much a an environment of you spoke about earlier the difference between you know, messing around in science is writing it down. Uh, but the idea of calling your shot, right? Like it behooves you not to just go 
find a supplier that can meet your timeline or your cost. It behooves you to just write down what do we need out of a supplier first and then say, like, we actually kind of called our shot and went out and found that person. Right. And you do that with every little thing along the way. And it's going to be the product's going to be better off for it. Yeah. Yeah. What are your requirements for your suppliers? It's a great yeah. question to ask. Yeah. yeah. It's gorgeous. <laughs> it's gorgeous. <laughs> it is. So, so now that we've got all these things to find, we built the thing to do the stuff and we've, you know, verified that it does it. Mm-hmm. How do you go into risk? Oh, you don't. No. Hmm. Okay. So how do you ensure that your design has the right controls it needs to mitigate the risks that are inherent or that might come up from using your device? Will you call Christy? <laughs> <laughs> it's a really expensive time to find those things out in verification testing, and it's even more expensive and scary and dangerous to let your users find that out. Yeah. So if you're in verification validation testing and you're starting your risk management, it's a bad time. You are so far, you are so late. Really, when you think about like the order of operations, okay, create your create your design and development plan. Mm-hmm. While you're creating your design and development plan, you're creating your user needs and your design input requirements. Once you figure out roughly what the project is, what's your indication for use going to be, right? That is the kind of information that goes like in your regulatory strategy that feeds into your design and development plan. You start your risk analysis immediately from the beginning. This is all part of planning. And this goes to like, I've been through concept stuff where we had an end goal and then we figured out the risk, like, oh, we can't go through path A, B, or C, because the risk is through the moon for a startup. We have to pick path D, E, or F. And it's like, you know, before you've even designed anything, it's just, what are we trying to do? And the risk starts, de- like, dividing and deciding what paths are available. So when you, fi- when you think through your risk analysis from the beginning, you don't have to have all the answers. Right. All you have to do is be able to imagine risk stories. Right. Yeah, yeah. Just dream nightmares and start <laughs> writing them down. Exactly. <laughs> dream exactly. nightmares and dream the steps that would lead to those nightmares right. happening. Right. Yeah, it's kind of. And you're getting there. It's a little bit twisted. <laughs> I think this is why Christy likes it. I do. But I this do. is back to sort of calling your shot, right? You mm-hmm. go through those thought experiments uh, and those inform what you actually end up putting in as controls, right? Exactly. Um, so if you if you think through like walking from the beginning, ISO 14971 and its gorgeous cousin, 24971, it's a technical report. So the ISO committee split up ISO 14971 in the 2019 version to rem- to remove the requirements that are really more like process suggestions. Mm-hmm. So now all of the suggestions for how to do risk management is in 24971. And it's all optional, but it's like best practices. It's, yeah. you know, the ISO committee. If you would like to do it right, please follow these instructions. Yeah. <laughs> these are really good ideas. Yeah. Um, so it walks you through different hazard categories, different, different hazards. Um, so you identify a hazard, maybe you say like a mechanical pinch point. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you, you first imagine um, what is the sequence of foreseeable events that like lead up to this? It's like your rising action in the story. And then what's the one thing that has to happen for that hazard to cause harm? That's your hazardous situation. So your foreseeable events are like the whole story rising up. And then like the climax of the story is like, that's your hazardous situation. Like, you know, the person touches the hot thing or the person sticks their finger in the pinch point. Right. Or like, you know, they lay their arm next to the device and it pinches them when they push on the plastics get together. Right. Like all these like little things that is that final thing. Because they have to get the device out, use it, be doing the steps. What leads into that one dangerous part? The one dangerous part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I like the one dangerous part to be one sentence. I'm like quite persnickety about it. (laughs) Like put all your background in your foreseeable sequence of events. And then your, your one sentence hazardous situation is like the thing that has to happen. Yeah. And the user sticks the fork in the socket. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Exactly. Um, Which leads to your harm and your harm can be to, to, to people. Um, In vitro diagnostics is really fun because it's not just your user. You imagine like, um, you know, you have your, you have your patient, you have a lot of times an oncologist who's receiving information from a pathologist who's receiving information from the lab tech who used the in vitro diagnostic. And how do you reduce the risk or control the risks to be acceptable all the way down to each of those people? Yeah. Super fun. 
And here we were at the beginning saying it wasn't nebulous. Yeah. Clear as mud. <laughs> Clear as mud. That's right. But you can step through in a systematic way um, and identify. Um, so the most fun part of this, like an early initial risk analysis for me. So you go through the standard and you say like, okay, mechanical, electrical, you know, biocompatibility mm -hmm. risks, um, usability risks. Uh, I know that's, that's a happy place for you, Ed. It is. Um, so you do your use related risk analysis and you find, um, you know, if they screw up step 10 um, in the IFU, you know, you don't have to have a full blown inf information for use. Mm -hmm. At that point, you have a bulleted list somewhere in a Word doc, you know, you baby step these things yeah. along. You know, I think somebody's going to do these things. Maybe you just write it out or you, you say it out. But yeah, you, you watch the intern use the prototype and you write down the steps he did. It's like the whole peanut butter and jelly story where it's like, yeah. you know, write down the instructions to make a PB and J and everyone's like, put the peanut butter on the bread. I'm like, where's the bread? Yeah. Right. And so that's, you know, how detailed do you get is where you are in the process. And right. earlier on, it's like, yeah, put the peanut butter and the jelly in the sandwich and eat it. And later on, it's like, go to the cabinet, open the door, get the knife and put this all together. Right. And, and the, the narrative you're telling right now that I really want to touch on is how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? It was all of what we all do in product development. Like yeah. we just start super early on mm -hmm. with really small tidbits and baby steps. It's like, well, I'm going to make, you know, for us, like in design, like let's just sketch it out. And then let's define how it's used and all these things. And it's not at the first day we have a functioning unit. Mm -hmm. And I think in quality and risk, it's the exact same way. Mm -hmm. right? Everything starts as a Word doc with some bad ideas on it somewhere. It does. It does. Your risk analysis starts as five lines mm -hmm. in an Excel document. You can, If you have funding and you want to build it out in a fancy EQMS, that's fine. <laughs> But you can start it. You don't need that. I wouldn't. I, <laughs> you do you, boo boo. Right. <laughs> Google Sheets is free to start. <laughs> Google Sheets is free to start. Um, you can set up some easy macros that make it so that you always, you know, you don't type uh, minor pinch and small pinch. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you always choose the same the vernacular. Same, yeah. The same vernacular, so it's not confusing, and you apply the same severity to each to the harm every time you use it. If there's a different severity for your harm, you need to describe the harm differently. Yeah. Um, so all of that. So you go through a scenario, you go through a whole risk story and you mm -hmm. say like, okay, this, um, this risk could gives us an unacceptable, this story gives us an unacceptable risk. We need to do something about it. At what point in product development do you want to figure that out? Really early. <laughs> really early. <laughs> Preferably before. <laughs> The teams that do the best in the end do this at the beginning. You talk to your users and you figure out your user expectations. You distill those into design input requirements. You look at what's po being populated in your design input requirements and you say, oh gosh, if we hit that temperature, what could happen to someone? Um, or if the sensor fails, what happens to somebody? Exactly. Right? And this is how you get into, do we actually need redundant sensors or not? And you can define where you choose to take risk. Because the other thing okay. before we wrap up here, I definitely want to touch on that's your favorite thing is the argumentative statement of, well, I'm actually not going to plan for that. Like this is a risk, it exists, and it's too much work to get around. And that whole decision matrix of justifying risk or justifying design decisions. And I think that's like the most nebulous part that's the most fun. Yeah, it's a, so yeah, to get to the end point here, at some point, you know, you're never done with risk management, but you do have to commercialize a product. Mm -hmm. um, how do you get to that point of, can, yeah, proving to yourself that you've gotten to that spot where you've addressed the risks sufficiently that you're comfortable. So you define what's acceptable for, for your organization. Mm -hmm. And if you still have risks that are not acceptable per the, st per the criteria that you set, by mm -hmm. the way, um, then you look at the totality of the product and you say, is the benefit of the device, does it outweigh the risk of using the device? Right, yeah. So 14971 calls it a BRA, the benefit risk analysis. And it's, um, it's really, it's not something, it's not a decision you can make in a silo. Engineers make terrible risk managers. <laughs> Especially towards the end of the program, when, yeah. when the gun's to the head, There's right? There's a timeline yeah. and you yeah. got to ship this thing. And yeah. Um, so, so you think about um, making a decision like that and, and you really need to bring in a medical doctor and you really need to bring in your top management. I mean, the standards require it, but also it's a good idea. Yeah. If you have risks, you can't mitigate that, you know, there's still the harm, the potential to harm someone is still higher than you'd like it to be. Um, you can still launch your product, but you better have open eyes. You better have justification for it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's back to the, the calling your shot, right? You don't define the pass fail criteria 
when you're doing the the analysis at the end, right? You call your shot at the beginning and say, what's going to be acceptable? Mm -hmm. And you you have that level head on the front end, right? Yeah, you set your acceptance criteria on the front end. Yeah. And then when you have to change them, what happens? You can, there's, it happens. No, I wanted to ask that because like, I know it does. It does and, and most users are like, yeah. what do you mean you can change it? the answer at the end? I'm like, you actually can because you learn more through the process and so much more gets uncomfort. You absolutely learn more, but you you write it down. You write it up in your report. We learned this and we are changing the requirement to be this and it's acceptable because, and it's it's all, product development is a gorgeous series of little tiny stories. Mm -hmm. And the more you document it, the more you can tell that story and justify what you're doing, which by the way, you you may have to do in a court of law one day. Right. Yeah. Um, which is another great reason to start your risk management file early, iterate it often. And document who's in it and why and when, right? All, all per the standard. And so I think one of the things that we do at Glassboard is, you know, there's two styles of project management that we, we write down, right? There's our Asana task list that's like the to-dos, mm -hmm. and then we have a running log for every project. And at the end of every day, anyone that touched that project just hops in, and it's a diary. It's a word vomit. I did these things. We found this out. I measured this stuff. And it's a accountability for like how much work we did internally. Like, hey, what did we actually do two weeks ago that we like build for did stuff? Mm -hmm. But it's also that accountability of like, this is when we learned that that style of measurement tool doesn't isn't accurate enough for this device. Mm -hmm. And there's a date on it, and someone wrote their name next to it, and it's that whole history file that's really loose. It's not overhead. This isn't like a whole process that someone's got to log in and spool up. And it's just a Google Doc that's shared with everyone on the team. Mm -hmm. And every day you add your notes. And as you get farther along and we have to start moving these things that, oh, I wrote this down here into an electronic QMS, they move up, but you still always dump your daily notes in that thing for the timeline history file. And for us, it brings me so much peace of mind knowing that either I as someone on the team can go find out what someone else did last week or three years from now, if someone asks, why did we make that choice? We can scroll through, find the date where we figured out that was the right part. This is why we chose that. It's actually written down somewhere and it's yeah. no touch, like no overhead. Yeah. And in the same spirit, you think about like you eventually you're going to have drawings. Right. We're going to have 3D prints and drawings. And that's that's great. They come out and you make an alpha. Yeah. Anytime you send out a 2D drawing to make a physical part, you better have a rev on it. Right. Because <laughs> you're going to use that part for some kind of test. And three months from now, you're not going to remember, shoot, was that before or at it? Before when, or after? When we added that fillet. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No, oh, man. And this is. Thou shalt put what changed from rev to rev in the notes. Somewhere. Yeah. Useful. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in 3D printing, put the rev on the part. Like Just emboss it somewhere in the part. Because that's the other thing that you, you end up with like 12 versions of your desk and they're all almost the same. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to emboss the part number or the rev number or whatever your, you know, whatever yeah. your change was on the physical parts. Even 12 months later, you dig up like, oh, this was this version. Scroll back in the vault to that version. Like, oh, that's what changed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's so easy to do that. Yeah. And it sounds trivial, but especially like <laughs> well, one of the things we, we do internally a lot. I mean, a lot of folks, we work in like sprints and things. So one thing we'll do is try and parallel path a lot. So in the same night, we might print V5, 6, 7, and 8 because mm -hmm. we're going to try a lot of things as quickly as we can. And it's really easy to just send all those without taking the time to the, update each yep. for, for the night. But, oh, uh, man. Yeah. Because the printers go burr overnight no matter how many you're sending. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're, you're sleeping. They're working. Yeah. So there's a little bit more, um, and not just not just individual part rev control, but mm -hmm. you almost want to make like a little, uh, let me see, let's see, right acronym, device history record, your DHR, your batch yeah. record. Mm -hmm. Make like a little, like make, make, a, make a bomb and, yeah. and all the, the instructions that you use. Yeah. For and each bomb should be revved. Oh, put weird. A rev, <laughs> put, a rev on your, put a rev on your bomb. Yeah. 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 I mean, what, what, it, what went into this, to this assembly that we used for this verification test, mm -hmm. even if you're not going to use it as like official verification testing that you intend to submit to the FDA, you are still going to make decisions based on the outcome of that test. And you're going to want to look back and say like, not just the 3d printed parts, but all the parts. Like McMaster yeah. screws <laughs> and like the washers. Yeah. So set your, set yourself up with a little bit of infrastructure. So it's easy to Add the rev, print it out, print it to PDF, stick it in a folder. But like, this is quality. This yeah. is like early quality. Like, I'm not asking you to set up a customer complaint process now. You don't need that. Right. You don't. You don't need a non-conforming material management <laughs> process right now. Right. You're yeah. running fast. You're. You're just point those scissors down while you're running. <laughs> right. Right. Well, and it's it's good. Use good tools. Right. So for us, like having a, a PDM, like a, pr a product data management system for our CAD files. 
Every time someone saves it and checks it in, there's a date and a name and there's a place for comments. And you better be filling that out, what changed and what this one was used for. And every time we ship an assembly or a prototype out of the office or gets used for a test, you check that in the vault and say, this is what we used on this date for this task or this got shipped out. And then that's locked somewhere. I don't care if someone deletes a part later. Yeah. I can scroll back to that comment, that date, and pull it all back open exactly how it was designed and printed. Yeah. Right? It's even, you know, even more robust than like filing that PDF somewhere in a drawing. It's like even before you're getting to drawings because you're concept in 3D printing, not making 2D prints. Mm -hmm. But you have a digital record that the user doesn't have to make. They hit the save button and it makes it. Mm -hmm. Right? Re remove the user from having to do the process by setting up good tools ahead of time. Yeah. It, you brought it up earlier, but it, this whole game is one of telling a story, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And those are all the little pieces, I think, that make it such a, a more full story, right? A more detailed story at the end of it. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, never, it's never boring. It's one of these things you just get better at over time. I remember you and I were talking about this like six months ago. Yeah. And we're like, man, you know, like, it's amazing that early on we were all doing these things without knowing these steps, but you just get better at it over time and, and experience helps. But yeah. it's one of those things that there is no actual right answer. There's just different degrees of better or faster or more efficient mm -hmm. throughout the process. And I think that's super powerful. These young companies not to get scared that you're not going to do it wrong. You're just maybe not going to do it the most efficient. Yeah. And you can always go back and do it again. It just takes time, effort, energy, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Like the, there is no like, oh, I've gone too far. I can't do this product anymore. You can absolutely start creating just a little tiny touch of quality wherever you are mm -hmm. in the process. Right. Yeah. It's it's never too late, but... Um, the earlier the better. The earlier the better. Yeah. yeah. There's no such thing as too early. No, for sure. I know we, uh, we're we on a, a time timeline at some yeah. point. Before we have, I would love to go... You work with a lot of startups. Yeah. Um, you obviously see the pitfalls. Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked through, I think, both ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do nothing. You also don't want to get overzealous and make it too heavy on the front end. Sure. Any other pitfalls that folks should hear about? Um, be super careful about s selecting suppliers. Yeah. That's like, really, you think about like early quality, it's like a little bit of doc management, just create, create records. Like we talked mm -hmm. about a little bit of risk management, a little bit of design controls. So those requirements, um, and then the last piece of like the really early, like, um, bootstrap QMS, if you will, is, um, a little bit of supplier management. So figuring out what are your requirements for, for the supplier? Is it a, are they parts? Are they, is it some kind of service? Is and it full assembly? Yeah. Is it, are they, and are they qualified to do that? Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of times people are like, oh, well they have an ISO 1345 certification for what? Yeah. Yeah. Design for manufacturing mm -hmm. for all of it, for something in between. Um, yeah. And that's not a Holy grail either. Right. Like yes. they can have that attached to their name and you can be unsatisfied. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've, I've, I've seen that too, where, um, a team has a manufacturing facility has a 1345 certification and they, um, Follow none of it. <laughs> yeah. They haven't exercised it yet. Yeah. You know, there, there's like maybe a project that they, they created some artifacts on, but it never made it to market for whatever reason and never really worked up the bugs in the process. And they're like, Device master rec, a DMR, what's that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's fun. It, it's, it's never a boring day in product development. It's never a boring day, yeah. But no, again, I think that's about all we've got time for here. So any any uh, last comments? I think we have like three more minutes. Uh, at the risk of sounding corny, I think we all have pretty amazing jobs. We get to work on <laughs> medical devices, things that make the world a better place. And I think that's pretty rad. No, yeah, no, it's it's awesome. Yep. Love it. Love my work every day. Yeah. It's so fun. Well, thanks for stealing time away from it to, to come and play with us today. Always, always happy to come. Out. It's been a blast. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for, for joining us today. Sorry about all the camera trouble we've been fighting on and off of the podcast, but we'll catch you guys next time. Thanks so much.